Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for July 22nd, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the hash circuitpython-dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting uh, typically happens Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the at CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to skip around and view parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev text, or text channel on Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. Uh, this is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a chosen set of items from our Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers separate from our status updates. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week. The fifth and final part is in the weeds. It's an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. That covers how the meeting will go. And with that, we'll start with community news and I'll switch over and take a time code. All right, so first up in community news, uh, connecting old to new with CircuitPython, retro computer input devices on modern PCs. Um, PyCon 2024 has published CircuitPythonista Jeff Epler's talk on connecting old to new with CircuitPython. Um, there's a link to the YouTube. Thank you, Foamy Guy, and thanks to Jepler, who's in the meeting, for doing this talk. Uh, quote, the input devices of decades past hold nostalgic value for many folks, but they don't need to merely sit on a shelf as museum objects. They can be reverse engineered and then adapted to modern computers without modifying the original hardware. CircuitPython is an excellent language for projects like these, thanks to native USB human interface device support, HID, and the ability to bitbang archaic interfaces combined with the fast development cycle of an interpreted language as you'll learn in case studies adapting keyboards and mice. And congrats to Jeff for that being published. Uh, second and finally, um, there's a new tutorial. It's writing MicroPython for your Raspberry Pi Pico in a web browser with Viper IDE. Les Pounder walks through the steps of using the new Viper IDE web code editor to utilize MicroPython on Raspberry Pi Pico. This is on Tom's hardware. And it, quote, you are not limited to just these two selections. Viper IDE also works with CircuitPython and ESP boards, Adafruit, Seed, and Microbit microcontrollers. With that, that's it for community news. The Python and Microcontrollers Weekly Newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. Um, the complete archives are available at the URL www.adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub. GitHub.com slash Adafruit slash CircuitPython dash weekly dash newsletter. Look for the drafts folder. Um, you can sub submit a pull request there with changes, or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com, 
or tag a post with hashtag circuit python on mastodon blue sky or x um, and we'll see it and put it in there paul comments in the chat that uh they've been playing around with viper ide this weekend and it's pretty neat all right next up uh the state of circuit python libraries in blinka this is a statistical overview of uh, the different core parts of the CircuitPython ecosystem, um, CircuitPython core, libraries, and Blinka. So first, let's do some stats overall. Overall, we had 12 pull requests merged from 10 different authors. So we hit double digits, which is great. Um, some new names that I have not seen regularly here are Tether, Johor, 42XNOR, uh, colon WQ, <laughs> Dark Mechanicum, uh, and Bablock B are all uh, infrequent or new contributors, so thanks to them. We had eight reviewers, which is awesome. Um, so thanks to Brent, Foamy Guy, Bits, Blood City, um, and Maker Melissa as less frequent contributors, although I guess Melissa, Melissa reviews all the time. Take that back. <laughs> um, thanks to all of our reviewers. Uh, we had 14 closed issues by seven people and 11 open by nine people. So a good amount uh, closed, uh, more closed than open, which is great. And uh, you know, higher single digits for people being involved, which is great as well. Now let's focus in on the core for a second. This is the C uh, core to CircuitPython. Um, we had two pull requests merged from two different authors, Dan and Jeff. Um, for four reviewers for those two pull requests, including uh, Foamy Guy in there. Um, we have 20 open pull requests, so we're comfortably under our uh, single page 25 PR goal. Issues wise for the core, we had uh, one extra or one new one. So we had five closed, but six opened, um, both by four people, although those four could be different folks. Uh, we have a total of 704 open issues. Again, this is climbing slowly, and that's okay. Um, we use milestones to triage and uh, prioritize for Adafruit-funded folks. Um, that is to say that if uh, other folks want, um, if other folks want to do uh, something that maybe we marked long term, that's totally cool. We're happy to support you in that, um, but it's not a priority for us. What is a priority for us is the seven open issues for 9.1x. Uh, we do want to, um, 9.1.0 is the current stable release, and there is a few issues that we do want to uh, polish up, and I think Dan's planning on doing a 9.1.1, but we'll hear about that more in just a bit. Um, we have zero issues not assigned to Milestone, so we are keeping up with triage as well. Um, and then we have 32 open issues that are a little bit longer term, too. Uh, that's it for the core, and now I will ask Foamy Guy to give us an update on the library stats. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, in library land this week, all of these stats cover the CircuitPython libraries, uh, which can all be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. Across all those libraries this week, we had nine pull requests merged by seven authors. Uh, echoing Scott, a couple of the names uh, mentioned that were newer or less frequent uh, to me as well, Tether, uh, 42XNOR, colon WQ, and uh, Johor. So thanks to those folks who might be newer or less frequent. Thanks to uh, some of the names that are more usual on the list, and thanks to all our five uh, reviewers this week. Um, of the pull requests that were merged this week, the oldest one was 46 days. The newest one, uh, the newest couple, were down at one day. That leaves us after the week with 51 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest one is a draft at 704 days. The newest one is two days actually this week. Um, over the past seven days, we had seven issues closed by two people with four new issues opened up by four people. That leaves us with 862 open issues. And there, <clears throat> excuse me, and there are 103 of those that are labeled as a good first issue, which you can find listed out over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is where you should head if you are interested in getting involved in CircuitPython. Um, on that page, again, circuitpython.org slash contributing, you'll find a list of all the open PRs and a list of open issues. Uh, you can take a look through the PRs, find something that is either interesting to you or that you've got the hardware for, uh, click through to GitHub, 
and then uh, take a look over the changes, uh, look at the code uh, for spelling and syntax, uh, as well as logic. If you do have the hardware, go ahead and test it out. Um, and then leave us a comment on GitHub letting us know that you looked it over or tried it and what you found. Uh, once you get comfortable with that process, we can get you leveled up to leave uh, official reviews if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, and on the uh, the flip side, if you're interested in trying to get some, uh, some actual uh, hands dirty coding yourself, you can check uh, out the list of open issues and again, find something either that you have an interest in or you have the hardware for, click through, uh, figure out you know if it's a bug fix or a new feature or whatever, and uh, take a stab at implementing that uh, in the actual code and submit your own PR for it. Uh, we do have guides to help you along uh, for contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. So if you need any help with the version control, uh, we can definitely point you towards resources on, on that. And we also have folks who are going to be around uh, on Discord uh, throughout the week that are more than happy to help you get spun up uh, with contributing. So if you uh, do want to get involved and you feel like there is some barrier, please uh, come say hi, come uh, ask us in the Discord, and we definitely can help uh, get you going. In terms of the PyPI uh, download stats for the week, uh, we did have uh, actually 244,154 PyPI downloads over the last week, um, which is a bit higher than uh, usual, I think. Uh, and then the list of libraries that are updated in the last seven days uh, are here in the uh, notes doc. So if you'd like to take a look at those, um, you can see them in there. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. All right, and last up, let's hear from maker Melissa about the state of Blinka. Hello, Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. Uh, that was, The author was uh, Dark Mechanicum. There were three open pull requests amongst all the repositories currently, and uh, there were two closed issues by one person and one open by one person, leaving a net of 100 open issues. There were 30,457 yeah, 30, PyPI downloads in the last week, 18,091 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we have 133 supported boards. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Uh, that is it for the State of CircuitPython Libraries of Blinka. The next section that we've got is called Hug Reports. This is the first of two round robin uh, sections where I will start and then we'll go through the folks that are listed in the notes doc. Uh, generally, it's alphabetical, uh, but if it's not, it's fine. We'll just go by the notes uh, order. Um, I should say this is another reason to join CircuitPython NISAs if you want to uh, speak up uh, in these uh, round robins, uh, you need to be in a circuit pipe on Nista's role. Okay, uh, Hug Reports uh, is a chance for us to say thank you to the folks that have been doing awesome work in our community. Um, this both uh, gives people credit for the awesome things they've been doing and also reinforces to each other kind of the things that we value. So I will start and we'll go down the list in the notes doc. All right, first up, uh, thanks again to Ch Tim Chinowski for continuing work on recording audio into raw samples. Um, I think there's gonna be some very cool, um, I know that they've done some very cool demos with this, so I'm excited about it. Uh, thanks to Rai for working on thread support um, and also to CareString for helping with the Matter library, uh, specifically the unit testing, which has been very helpful. And then uh, a hug for report for the future to Foamy Guy for filling in on Deep Dive next week. With that, let's go to Dan. OK, uh, thanks for Jeff for uh, doing IPv6 um, on uh, Espressif. Obviously, it's needed for the matter stuff, and it makes it work on does some future proofing of certain Python. Uh, thanks for Scott for all the diving into matter that he's doing. Um, thanks to Erland, a Discord user, who had a BLE on a BLE interoperability issue between NRF BLE and a third party uh, device. And I was able to reproduce that problem. I'll talk about that later, but that was really helpful. And thanks to Foamy Guy who's starting to convert libraries to rough instead of black and pilot. We have several examples and uh, we're on the way to doing that. It's great. Okay. 
All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, next up, I have some notes from DJ Devin3, who says, a hug report to Dan H and Liz Clark for the LC709203F ba battery monitor code in the ESP32-S3 Feather Learn Guide. Started a new project and the code definitely works better than previous versions. Also a hug to Tyeth for looking into past suggestions and making some tweaks to improve the MQTT documentation. And now let's hear from Foamy Guy. All right, thank you. Um, first up for me, hug report. Thanks to C Grover for letting me know about some issues that my stream was, uh, some audio issues that my stream was having over the weekend, and uh, offering up some ideas on uh, what could be the issue to help troubleshoot. Um, thanks to Jeffler for submitting a fix for the uh, core stubs uh, this week sometime, and a uh, group hug for everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Next up is Jeffler. Hello. Um, a group hug. I uh, love knowing that this community keeps checking along while I'm traveling for a few weeks. I'll say a little bit more about that later. And um, I lost the name of this person, but somebody reminded me during last week's meeting that there is such a thing as an IPv6 tunnel. And um, I used one of those to test IPv6 global connectivity on the code that I'm working on uh, right now, and it worked. So that was really exciting. Awesome. Thanks, Jepler. I think that might have been during show and tell, but somebody pointed that out. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. Anyway, thank <laughs> you to that person. And I don't know who it was because I just heard the report that there had been a YouTube like live comment. So yeah, right. that's right. But if you're listening, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, our, we have a very wide, helpful community. All right. Uh, next up, let's go to Melissa. I wanted to give a hug to Dan for your help with code editor and a group hug to everyone else. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, next up we have um, two folks that aren't here and then that'll end hug reports. First from Mikhail Pakusa says, uh, hug to Tyeth for pair program session regarding video streaming example using Memento with Adafruit HTTP server. And then also uh, from Tyeth, they say, uh, hug to Jeff, Dan, Elf Pekinen, and Scott for being helpful in my quest for merging dictionaries, release note advice, tolerant of my inane questions and general soundboarding. All right, and that's it for hug reports. Next up, we have another round robin section, but this is status updates. Um, this is a chance to just tell the community what you're working on uh, by saying what you've been working in the previous week and what you plan on doing in the next week. It's a great way to collaborate uh, if somebody's working on something that you've worked on in the past or are currently working on. Um, and it's also just fun to hear about all the different things that people are doing. So uh, I'll start and we'll go through the list. Uh, logistics things to start off with. Um, I'm around all this week, but out, I'm out next Thursday and Friday for a long weekend with family. Um, I'm working on Matter, which is an IoT spec, and I'm working on getting messages encoded and sent back out onto the wire. Um, over the last week, I did a deep dive on Friday, and I actually was surprised how much I got done, which is good. Um, I added message counter validation, um, and this is also involved in duplicate detection um, for like UDP reliability sorts of things. Um, there's also a notion of an exchange, so I now have a structure for matching an incoming message to the given exchange. Um, I'm encoding TLV structures. This is a, a kind of like standard format for packaging structs into onto the wire. Um, so there's there's decoding and encoding now for those things. And then lastly, I kind of re-hooked up all of my machinery to the network. And as I did that, I made it so that I could record and then replay back the incoming packets. So I, as I get further into this like packet back and forth, I'll be able to run it once with my live network and having to do this stuff on my phone app, but then be able to replay it um, as I fix things. <laughs> Um, and so that should make it easier to develop. So that's, I'm, I'm in the thick of matter still, but it's uh, still making progress, which is good. There's just a lot to do. Uh, next up, let's see where Dan's at. And sorry about the fire extinguisher sounds. That's the other thing out my window. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, I fixed a bug that had to do with um, NRF interoperating with other BLE implementations 
It has to do with the negotiation of the MTU, which is how big um, the logical packets are. And on NRF, it defaults to 512, but Espresso was defaulting to 256, and it was negotiating that correctly, but internally the NRF code expected a certain value to be passed and it wasn't, and we weren't checking for errors. Okay. So it kind of dropped the connection after a while for mysterious reasons. Okay. So that's fixed now and it works better. I have examples of NRF talking to BLE, uh, to uh, Press if that work. Um, I'm looking at some other bugs to fix in the short term uh, for 911. Uh, there's, there's a report that uh, a 910, some boards with onboard displays don't work at all, or the displays don't work, which is really bad. So we should fix that really soon. And so I'll probably do a 911 release as soon as that is released. Um, I'm continuing to work on merging MicroPython version 1.22 into CircuitPython. That's kind of a long process, but I'm well on the way to that. After that, there is version 1.23 to merge and they haven't released 1.24, but that would probably be fairly soon. Um, and I created a branch 91X on the CircuitPython repo. So now if you have a bug fix against uh, 9.1, uh, please submit the bug fix to the 9.1X branch. Please you know, um, change the base. So it's against 9.1X instead of main. If you have some feature addition, then uh, PR it to main uh, and we'll merge from 91X to main as needed. So the motivation for this was that the IPv6 PR is now ready to review and we want that to go into 92, not 91 something. Right. And that's it. Yeah, and to be clear, bug fixes should go in 91 first and then be merged over. The reverse is harder to maintain. as you said. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up, I will read DJ Devin 3 who says, uh, worked a little more on an irrigation touchscreen controller project. Progress is slow because I'm also outside digging 50 feet trenches for new irrigation pipes. Hope to show off a CircuitPython powered touchscreen irrigation controller someday. And now let's hear from Foamy Guy. All right. I uh, over the weekend looked into a couple library PRs, one in the portal base that um, extends the max attempts functionality over to get local time, um, which so that existed on connect, but uh, did not used to exist on get local time. Someone submitted PRs to make it so that you can actually pass that through now. Uh, and the other one was on the WizNet, the Ethernet uh, Featherwing. There was a fix for DHCP uh, lease timings, um, which was cool. It actually seems to make um, uh, make them more stable uh, on my network, which has always been a little bit weird uh, as well. So that was cool to see. Um, another thing I saw that popped up over the weekend was the uh, an issue on one of the display drivers where someone submitted um, an issue over on GitHub where they were trying to use it on, I think it was actually on a Raspberry Pi in hindsight uh, with Blinka Display IO, but it wasn't working. And it was due to that display driver not being updated for the new um, version of the API, specifically the move over to um, bus display. Um, and I did a quick search through the bundle uh, the other day and there were only a couple of those, I think four. Um, so I have been working through those submitted PRs this morning to switch those over. And then as part of those PRs, I did go ahead and switch those repos to ref uh, as well, since I was going to be running pre-commit and everything to submit them anyway. Um, and then uh, there are a, a few more, I, I want to say six or eight uh, or 10 more that um, also have references to the old APIs, but they're actually in doc strings and type annotations. So it's um, not necessarily as critical, but I am working through changing those uh, as well, and I'll swap them to ref while I while I do them too. Uh, and then uh, this morning I looked uh, through some different releases on the PyPortal Titano was the device I was using, but this issue um, is a wider problem for, I guess, AMD51s that have a built-in display, or at least some of them, um, and uh, bisected through the different versions to find the first one where the issue occurs. Uh, I don't necessarily understand what the issue is, but I did find 
um, where it was introduced. Um, and that's what I have got going on. Thanks. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Next up, let's hear from Jepler. Hi again. So my main focus has been working on this IPv6 stuff. And what I've done since the last meeting was made more of the um, uh, socket operations work. Well, actually, I'm not sure whether anything worked when I was in this meeting last week. But uh, so the state of it is that most everything works with IPv6 on Espressive. There are some things that we will move on to fu future pull requests, like um, if you need to statically configure your IPv6 addresses. That's an example of something that you can't do. Um, but that PR is marked ready for review, and it is green on GitHub action, so that is really exciting. And my focus for the rest of the week will be to respond to the review comments so that we can get that merged, and as well add an IPv6 section to a page on Learn so that people will be able to see just some examples um, of here's how you do IPv6 at a low level. Um, another thing about this is that, for instance, I haven't checked whether request library uh, works um, or any of those other higher level libraries. Um, because our focus is on this as an enabling part of uh, having matter on CircuitPython, which Scott has, uh, is going to tell us about, I think, in a little bit. So anyway, uh, that is what my focus is, and I kind of have a hard deadline at the end of the week because I am going on vacation. And in the notes document is a link to my account on Metapixel. I'll be posting up some pictures there during the trip randomly from time to time. So if you want to find out about what I am doing, you can either, you know, load that web page, follow me on Mastodon or in an RSS reader. And that's what I've got. Thank you, Jepler. I verified that I am following you on Metapixel, so I'm excited to see your trip pictures. All right, next up, uh, let's hear from Maker Melissa. Hello. Uh, so I finished updating the CircuitPython code editor to use the raw REPL um, for connecting uh, and doing all the operations. It, and it has improved reliability for USB workflow. I created a, a PR to add all the missing CircuitPython and Blinka boards. I'm working on setting up a beta site for testing out uh, the code editor changes before they go live. And I'm currently going through uh, Raspberry Pi and Blinka issues. That's our map. Thank you, Melissa. All right, and last up, I had notes to read from Tyeth, who says, uh, first, added some updates to the Adafruit IO CircuitPython library. Mainly worth worthy of note are new commands, send group data, and improved send batch data, along with new optional argument for time zone when using io.receive time. There's an updated example for send group data and a new example for send batch data for CPython 2. I've tried to include usage showing sending older time points using created at, which uses io.receive time to base timestamps from. It might be worth people revisiting any time-based guides that have, have known issues with time fetching. Previously, io receive time would only use IP-based auto detection for time zone, which is unreliable. So now UTC, et cetera, can be requested directly. That's it from Taya. Okay, and that's it for status updates. So lastly, we have in the weeds. This is a, a chance for us to have any long form uh, discussion. Tends to be um, questions or things that people wanna bring up and ask about. So we have one topic uh, from Jerry this week. So I'll ask Jerry to, to ask us, introduce us. What's going on? Hi, right. uh, thanks Scott. So this is something I've been working on this library for, for a long time. Um, actually worked on it a lot, quite a long time, like several months ago, and haven't done much lately other than some, some testing. But uh, what it does is it's, it's a combination of the RFM69 and RFM9X libraries to a common library. Um, and it adds a bunch of new features, uh, oh, async IO, and you can it allows you to run without using the radio to head headers, so there can be more compatibility with other libraries. I also added FSK and OOK support to the RFM 9X, so now an RFM 9X can talk to an RFM 6.9 if you want to do that. Um, I still got you know, a fair amount more testing to do to make sure all the you know, various features are actually working and 
and seeing if it if it fixes all the all the existing bugs that were in the other other libraries. Mm -hmm. But I realize it's probably time to to open it up for people to comment on the code, you know, point, make sure I'm even in the right direction at all on this whole thing. So my question is, how do I do that? It, I started it as a sort of under the community library, I think, in the cookie cutter, but it's it's in my own repository. Mm -hmm. So how do I how do I move ahead with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would. Uh... Add it to the community bundle, like you're saying, and then maybe post to the forum, uh, asking people to use it. Because I know you answer a lot of questions on the forums about it. So having like a how, getting started for people to reference would be good. So how, how do I go about adding it to the community bundle? Uh, you do release from your repo, and then uh, you make a PR to the community bundle, adding it as a submodule. I think the creating and sharing a library guide has instructions on how to do that okay i'll take a look at th I, I, yeah i didn't quite follow that step but I, I'll, I'll okay i'll look at that and i'll ask questions on the on discord if i need help um so i know when i build it myself now um thanks um it it, it doesn't go to PyPy, Pi, and is that something that will happen once it goes in the community bundle or is there it's separate from the yeah. community bundle. Foaming it's right now it's separate from the community bundle. When I, and when I, um, uh, well, well, maybe I'll, I'll just poke around with it and, and see. But if I, so I, oh, so, okay, so I just have to create a release, which I haven't done yet. Okay. Maybe that, that'll make a difference. Tim, you can speak to. Oh, when you run cookie cutter. Yeah, sorry. Okay. We, well, if I, so if I, I've already run Cookie Cutter a long time ago to get this set up. So, how do I change that? <laughs> um, the easy. So you can either find which which files in there um, need to be changed, which is basically the actions files, um, so that the release action will contain whatever it needs to actually push it to PyPy. Truthfully, the easiest way, though, rather than going to try to track down individual files and train and change them as if you just run cookie cutter again and oh. this time choose um choose yes for PyPy, Pi, and then that's going to generate you kind of like the scaffold basically you can just copy paste those into your existing repo uh, or you could copy paste your code into that new cookie cutter uh, either way and then and push from there the bigger question is, is is should i do that at this stage or should i wait till after it's been accepted into the into the community bundle before i put it out to PyPy? Pi? You know, I'm not. Um, what, I mean, in my mind, that's. Thing? In my mind, I think it's totally an optional thing up to up to you as the developer of the library. Um, yeah, I think there's no. I don't know that there's necessarily one direction or the other that um, is pointed to as the the correct way or the best way or anything like that. It's just um, some people have them on PyPy because they use it from there, and some people. Leave them off PyPy and just use like Circup uh, will still work without PyPy as well. So um, even if it's not deployed to there, it's still easy to use on microcontrollers. Okay, and and is the is the name I've been using is right now Circuit Python RFM. Anybody object to that or have a concern with that? <laughs> no, I think that's a good name. Yeah, because it covers both. Okay, well I'll, I'll try and move ahead with it soon and. You know, like I said, I'd like to get some people looking at it and saying, oh, my God, you can't do that. So before I, mean, I, I say, like, If you want it, since it's a test release, you could give it a release number of like 010 or 050 or okay. 090, wherever you feel like it. And I would say go ahead and turn on the PyPy. It's cheap to do the PyPy thing, and anybody who wants to use it can. And if they want to test it on a Raspberry Pi or something, it makes life a lot easier for them. So I say go ahead and do it. And you don't have to do it in a particular order. OK. I just want to jump in and say that um, at one point, it was required to release on PyPy for a specific circumstance. And that is if you were using, um, which, which GUI is it? The uh, the MicroPython. Thani, I think. Thani would uh, be able to get modules from PyPI and install them directly on a board, but it didn't work with uh, with Circup or with bundles. 
And that's the reason that at, at one point we decided we would just do that as a default for Adafruit CircuitPython libraries. But that doesn't mean that you have to do it, but that's why we've done it for many of them that it seems unlikely that people would run them on Blinka, just to, to give you the history there. And if I'm gonna if I rerun cookie cutter for some reason, do I can I just do that on the existing you know my repository, or do I or you know cut my local copy, or do I really start over in, with it in a, a blank? I would I would start if it were me personally at least I would start over with a blank one. So I would create like a new directory, run right. cookie cutter in that new directory, and then once it generates the files for you. Right. Um, then you can kind of choose which way you want to copy paste. You could take those files and paste them into your existing repo, or you can take your existing, the, the code implementation part okay. of your existing one and paste it into the new cookie cutter. And I don't think it matters necessarily which way you go there. Uh, but I would start it in a blank one just so that you don't run into a situation where cookie cutter tries to clobber any of your existing like actual code implementation stuff. Okay, good, good, good suggestion. It's been a long time since I've done any of this stuff, so just rusty. All right, thanks. I, I would say copy, because you. I don't think you want to start over with a new repo, so I would say copy from a blank cookie cutter into your, re, your repo. It's also true that if you just run cookie cutter in your own existing clone, you'll see which files it's changed. Right, yeah, that, so, that's if it if it you know you, there's a chance to back that out like you try that first and if it if it messes things up yeah then i would say you could do this manual thing but otherwise okay uh i, I think another question is whether cookie cutter like if any files from cookie cutter have been dropped for some reason then they're not going to get deleted by running cookie cutter. So it's probably interesting to run cookie cutter and see if there's any superfluous files right. that you don't need anymore or something. But I would just do that experimentally right. rather than copying it by hand because it's just more, much more chance of something going wrong if you do that. So. All right, good. All good suggestions. I'll try and okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, I, my brain was definitely like, oh, maybe we should make a matter to Laura Bridge. Or a ladder, a matter to RFM bridge, <laughs> but we're uh, pretty far from that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, and that's it for in the weeds. Um, so I'm gonna take another time code to wrap up, and we'll get out of here. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for July 22nd, 2024. Thank you to everyone who's taken the time to join us or put notes in the notes doc. Thought about it. Um, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing for Adafruit, the, from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. With that, uh, thank you all for joining. We hope to see you all next week. Uh, have a great week.